Hello, everybody. I'm Lucas Grinley. I'm the executive director of Next City, and I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the future of monumentality. This is our second day of conversation focusing on alternatives to monumentality. Yesterday's discussion was both beautiful and informative. One of our panelists called it real. Um, if you missed part one, what is monumentality? Stay tuned for the recording posted in the next few days at uh, Next City's webinar archive. A recording of the event will also be posted um, uh, you can check it out, find a link in the chat. There's going to be a lot of links in the chat where you can find places to go. Um, I have, before we begin, a few announcements regarding the logistics of the event. Uh, these will also be included in the chat. All attendee videos are automatically turned off and microphones are muted. Um, if you'd like to use the closed captioning, please go to the button at the bottom of your screen and click on the CC option. Here you'll be able to turn on and off the captions. And throughout the presentation and discussion, we invite you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. One of our editors will select from your many questions and share them with our moderator. Please use the chat with our, uh, to engage with all your fellow attendees and let's keep the conversation going. If you have any technical questions as we go, please drop those in the chat as well and someone will help you. The Future of Monumentality is presented by Next City. We're a nonprofit news organization that believes in solutions journalism. Our reporting shares good ideas that inspire hopefully greater economic, environmental, and social justice. And we're jointly presenting this program with the Highline, a nonprofit organization and public park on the west side of Manhattan, whose mission is to reimagine the role of public spaces in creating connected, healthy neighborhoods and cities. The Future of Monumentality, as I mentioned, is a two-part speaker series that tackles questions surrounding monuments at this unique intersection of art, design, and urbanism. And over these two days, you'll hear from artists, historians, architects, designers, government leaders around issues of power, engagement, and representation. In fact, we have so much to talk about that I invite you to watch for our uh, Future of Monumentality ebook coming soon from Next City in the next few weeks. The ebook is going to include re reporting on related projects plus edited transcripts of these conversations. Share it with your friends, colleagues, the whole world. And if you don't want to miss that ebook, uh, please sign up for our new arts and culture email newsletter. There will be a link for that in the chat as well. Thanks for attending this event. And I'd like to share a special thanks to all of the Highline and Next City supporters here today. We'd like to thank those of you who donated to attend this event. Your contributions make partnerships like this one possible. And although we're in a virtual space together, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I am coming to you today from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on the ancestral land of the Lenni Lenape. And if you're interested in finding out the name of the indigenous people whose land you live on, please visit the link in the chat. Now, I would like to introduce our event moderator, Salamisha Tillett, named by 
Gloria Steinem as one of the best contemporary feminist writers. Salamisha is a contributing critic at large for the New York Times and the Henry Rutgers Professor of Creative Writing and African American and African Studies at Rutgers University, Newark. She is also the founder of New Arts Justice, an initiative for feminist approaches to socially engaged art at Express Newark. And in 2003, with her sister, Shaharazad Tillit, she founded A Long Walk Home an art organization that empowers young people to end violence against girls and women. We're absolutely thrilled for her to be joining us today as our moderator. It was an amazing conversation yesterday, thanks to Salamisha. And with that, Salamisha, I'll pass it to you. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here for part two of what is a really lively and urgent conversation. Um, yesterday, we talked a lot about the, the, the concept of a monument and how do we engage these icons and um, symbols from the past to reimagine our future. And today I'm really excited to think um, about, to, to kind of undo or unpack the very questions that we were having yesterday and to think about the future of monumentality, um, what will be um, for all of us, another way of thinking about ourselves, um, the communities that we inhabit and uh, the, the, the land in which we live. Um, I would like to open with a quote. Um, I am at heart a writer and a literary critic. And so I want to open with a quote um, of an artist that I've been um, a, a literary artist, a writer, who at the beginning of the pandemic, I really returned to. And I just think Octavia Butler, um, when you're thinking about futurity and, and, and speculating on potential um, ways of being in, in, in the, the time to come, She's always a, a useful uh, a muse um, and uh, a figure to engage. So I'm just gonna do a quick quote from Octavia Butler and then I'm gonna introduce our uh, esteemed panelist. So this is from uh, 1993, Parable of the Sower. And Octavia Butler writes, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. And so with that, I would like to introduce um, our panelists since we'll be talking about to, uh, truth and change and the truth of change um, will shape our conversation today in many ways. Our first panelist is Mayor Marvin Rees and is the mayor of Bristol, the first major European city to have elected a mayor of black African heritage. His background is in social justice, international development and journalism, um, which led him to become mayor. Um, and this he describes an expression of his deeper commitment to building a fairer, more inclusive world. Um, mayor Rees is declared Bristol a city of hope, built on ambition and inclusion. Our next panelist would be Brian Lee Jr., uh, who is the design principal of, um, sorry, of Collate uh, and the national design, and a national design justice advocate. Lee has a decade of experience in the field of architecture and is the founding organizer of the design justice platform and organized the design as protest National Day of Action. So this is already such a riveting panel. Uh, next, we will have um, Dr. Shoshana Zagedi mazik um, who is the head of the Budapest Gallery at the Budapest History Museum, which consists of the Department of Art and Public Spaces and Exhibition Department. In 2009, she served as the curator of the Hungarian Pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennial. Uh, Zagadi Mazek has recently organized an exhibition on politically charged sculptures removed from public spaces in the years following the fall of, of communism in Hungary. And last but not least, Rebecca Belmore is a multidisciplinary artist focusing on the political and social realities of indigenous communities. Belmore's work um, may make evocative connection between bodies, land, and language. And she's a member of the Laksu First Nation and has shown her work throughout Canada and internationally. So I would like to um, open it up to the first panelist again, um, Mayor Marvin Reese. Hello, um, my video is not coming on, but that might not be a bad thing, I guess. <laughs> It's on now. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Um, so um, I, know I appreciate the chance to um, be with you this evening. So, so I'll, I'll share a little bit about uh, monuments and statues in Bristol. It was obviously, um, there was a lot of focus on the city um, in light of, uh, of the, the rally over the summer, the Black Lives Matter rally, uh, where uh, the statue of Edward Colston uh, 
um, who was a slaver, um, uh, was hauled down and thrown into the docks. And just to say, um, <clears throat> I was very clear in my interviews from the, st the start, because there was a trick question put to me by the journos with me being a mayor, was what do I think of it? Um, and what I shared was that um, I am um, descended from enslaved Africans. So my, my father came to the UK from Jamaica as a 12 year old. And, uh, and I can't find, a, 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 I can't uh, pretend that I was found, felt anything other towards the statue than, uh, than, than uh, absolute disdain. Um, uh, even if I wasn't descended from enslaved Africans, the idea of having a statue to a slaver in the middle of my city, again, was just something that I don't think would, would go along with my values. At the same time as an elected mayor of a city, I cannot condone criminal damage. Um, and as difficult as those are to hold together, it's just something that they're just going to have to reconcile uh, with um, holding together. Um, and that's the, the position I, I communicated. This statue um, is <clears throat> has become uh, kind of really totemic uh, within Bristol. It, it was contested for uh, many years. In fact, I, I um, uh, with some friends, made a documentary back in 2007, which is the 200th anniversary of William Wilberforce's bill to abolish the Slave Trade Act. So William Wilberforce was an MP in the UK and pushed forward anti slavery legislation uh, for 1807 didn't actually take effect for another 30 years but um nevertheless he pulled it he pushed it through in 1807 and during that that documentary i did a piece to camera right next to the statue in which i read out the plaque which on the base of the statue describes colston as a wise and virtuous son um, of the city um the, the there are num there are numerous streets in the city named after colston there's colston street there was a colston tower there's a colston hall there was a Colston Girls School, there's a Colston School uh, for, for boys, a, a private school. So his name was everywhere. And that is in part the, the product of a, a the whole set of mythology that was built around him as a founding father, as it were, of the city, a great philanthropist of Bristol. Now, the truth is, he didn't actually live in Bristol bar one or two years uh, during his life. And, and he gave money away, but it was only to certain groups of people, didn't like Catholics was not necessarily interested in overturning the class structure uh, within the city. So it's kind of ironic. The statue went up in the first instance. It was not about um, upholding slavery. The statue went up to create this mythology uh, within the city and to create some kind of founding father uh, uh, a myth. It's, it's latterly that it's been really been focused on as a conversation around uh, slavery and what we choose to remember in Bristol. So the statue was pulled down and thrown in the harbour, which I said was a piece of poetic justice because it was, it was that very harbour that Colston ships would have docked um, as they were going to head off on that first leg of what's called the triangular trade, with ships taking manufactured uh, products to um, Africa and then from Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean with people and then bringing raw materials back to, uh, uh, to the UK, which is why it was such a profitable business because the ships were... Uh, never empty and it made a lot of money for uh, Bristol uh, merchants. So the statues pulled down. Now I'd say in the first instance in the way that we've um, approached it is to say that we don't necessarily want to get caught up um, in the statue in and of itself. Symbols are massively significant. They set a tone and they set a meaning and they give a meaning. But very quickly um, our approach was to say that the, that when we are tackling uh, monuments, it has to be attached to real policy, symbolic acts without real policy that look that looks at issues of education inequalities, mental health and, and physical health inequalities, inequalities in the criminal justice system, in housing, in wealth and ownership. Uh, symbol, symbolic acts that do not attack those deeper injustices soon become sources of cynicism. And so one of the, 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 the real drivers that, that we, we came out the back of this incident with was to say that actually we're in the business of making a real change um, in the city. And that, in, in fact, I would say it was a real challenge I did put to some of the, um, the, the, the people that um, hauled it down as they began to ask me why I hadn't hauled it down, which I'll get to that. You can't be the first uh, black mayor in Europe and the first thing you do is take down a statue to slavery. It's all I would have talked about for four years rather than getting at those issues of substance. Um, but I said to them, well, what is the policy that you're, you're advocating for? And, and actually they didn't have one. Um, 
and I gave them a couple of weeks and they had no real policy beyond the, the statute. So I would just say that's really important is to make sure that it is attached to, to the, the drivers of substantive wider social change um, as, as well. I think also in our approach, I would say that uh, we, we, we took approach in which we could always say our aim is to build stuff, not to take stuff away. Um, now, it does mean changing monuments because, because of what they say, but we're not, we're not leaving a vacuum uh, when we do that. We're bringing better policy and we're actually aiming to build better society. And so I set out from the start to say that I need to respond to this in a way that if you are someone who is elated at the statue being pulled down and thrown in the harbour, this is a city that respects you and will be a home for you. If you're someone who's glad the statue has gone, but uh, concerned at the way it happened, again, this is your city. And if you are someone that's dismayed at the statue coming down, because somehow you've bought into the story that, Brist that Colston is an integral part of Bristol and therefore part of your identity, then I still have to be able to show that this is your city but it's a city that's going on a journey and you need to come on the journey with that city because it respects you and, the, and you have to stay with the city as it journeys through this period of change. And that, that latter has been a real uh, challenge actually, but one I think we have uh, done reasonably well on. The week after the statue was pulled down, there was like a, what, what was kind of portrayed as a counter rally um, organised by football fans, um, which have, some of them had a hooligan history and Hell's Angels turned up as well, interestingly. To, to protect the cenotaph because they felt that the next thing to go was going to be the cenotaph which is um i don't know if you call it that in the united states but a monument for the memory of fallen um soldiers and so a few hundred people rallied down the cenotaph now it was portrayed as a far-right rally but it was not actually a far-right rally there were some racists there but it wasn't in and of itself i arranged to go and talk to the organizer of that rally actually which has paid incredible dividends and I asked him, well, what was going on for him? And interestingly, he said, we don't mind statue going away, uh, but what, we, what, what, what we're concerned about is losing our city. And I saw a mix of issues there that as we, if we can deal with that issue of what, what monuments mean to everyone, begin to, and to bust some of the mythology that's around them or what they actually mean, then it creates space for a conversation um, uh, in which we can collectively decide to, to move them. If we, you know, and we walk this tightrope, we can't, we can't go at the pace of the slowest, but we need to take people with us. And that's that's the tightrope uh, we've been trying to walk in the city, which is why it's been so important for us to reach out. Now, in the name of that, we've also set up in the city a Bristol History Commission. Um, and we've pulled together a bunch of historians. And, and the point of this History Commission is to tell the full story of Bristol. I, I felt our feeling was that the, the approach to our monuments uh, was, was based on different understandings of what the monuments uh, meant different different truths as it were alternative facts you might say if the uh, the Trumpian um, era and um, our point was can we come to a common understanding of what Bristol is how it how it come to be that city Re reveal the stories of real heroes from Bristol's be they trade unionists fighting for dockers uh, rights suffragettes fighting for women's rights abolitionists again fighting for the end of slavery and, and equality and with that fuller understanding of who we are bring the city to a more mature conversation around, well, does, does Colston, does someone like Colston fit with who we are? Does he actually, is he still, if you know this fuller story, is he still what you say he is in terms of someone that captures the spirit of the city or what we want uh, the city uh, to stand for? And that's the journey we've, uh, we've uh, just started out on, really unearthing that fuller story of the city. We'll be pulling together community groups to contribute their own uh, local uh, contributions um, to that 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 fuller uh, storytelling. Um, just yesterday, I had a talk with Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, his two deputy mayors who have started a similar process in the United States uh, to, uh, sorry, no, in, in London, to tell that fuller story, because obviously they have many more monuments, people like Churchill, who was a racist, um, at the same time, he was a war hero, right? And, and to, and, but to not be afraid of those complexities, but to put those complexities of those individuals on, on, in public, full public gaze, and then make a collective decision about uh, what we do with those public spaces. But making them welcoming to all Bristolians, building community and building society is what we've tried to keep a laser-like uh, uh, focus on. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, we're going to switch over to Brian now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. That was fantastic, as always. I uh, do appreciate it. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a project that some of you may know, some of you may not. But uh, in New Orleans, uh, over the last six years, um, at least in its most recent incarnation, we've been seeking to remove racist monuments from the landscape of the city, uh, not simply as the mayor talked about, just as a, as a response to symbols, but uh, more broadly as a response to the systems that are represented by those symbols. Um, so in uh, 2015, on the backs of 30 years of activism and advocacy uh, on the ground around monuments, um, and 30 years before that, so 60 total years of people advocating for racist monuments to be removed from the landscape. Um, we started a project called Paper Monuments. Um, there were other organizations on the ground who were doing work as well, um, but this was a cultural organizing effort that was specifically geared at a public planning process to activate the voice of communities, not just in response to what existed, but what were the speculative futures that might be possible if we rallied around what um, stories and narratives we wanted to hold valuable moving forward. So the basic theory is just simply that form follows the fiction uh, that we tell ourselves. It's the narratives, the stories that relate and map to the kind of cultural considerations of place. Uh, and this wants to, this project and this process wanted to live into that uh, theory at its best. Uh, so the context, again, there were those uh, over the course of, uh, of our time from 2015, uh, to mid to late 2017 uh, that were clearly on the wrong side of history, um, uh, some on the right side of history. And as, uh, as the trajectory became clear for those on the wrong side of history, uh, you saw the joy uh, get a little bit more uh, palpable uh, for those on the right side of history. Um, now, I'll say, you know, as as uh, protests around removing uh, monuments in our city continue to grow over time, uh, this is before we saw Charlottesville, before we saw some of the violence um, uh, across the country in relationship to um, uh, to monuments, uh, and after you saw Bree Newsom climb a, a flagpole to tear down a racist uh, flag. Um, our city had uh, a, a set of issues that always needed to be uh, addressed. And these just became a lightning rod to address them. And so we asked ourselves as a community, can we imagine new monuments to New Orleans? And to expand the definition and promise of what a monument is, um, understanding that monuments are monumentality and it's, and it's uh, broadest form go from kind of uh, the idea of a mandala to uh, to markers to monuments to uh, memorials all the way up to the scale of museums. These are all forms of monumentality that are representative symbols of a broader um, a, a broader set of systems or, or principles that we value in this world. And so in asking the collective, can we imagine new monuments to New Orleans? It wasn't simply about asking a set of designers or a set of uh, kind of cultural practitioners to, to respond as, as individuals. It was really a way for us to kind of get the aggregate narrative of the city. And so we did that by leaning into uh, to, to thousands of people on the ground, uh, many of which hadn't really paid much attention to um, to that cultural landscape. It became, as, as the mayor mentioned, what we call the, the, the residue of, of kind of history was attached to these places, regardless of what their symbology actually uh, was. Uh, and so we had to counter that and, and at least address it in the the work that we were doing. And so the work of many uh, through paper monuments became one in which we were publicly organizing folks to 
uh, uncover and 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 lionize or at least lift up the stories of collectives of people, places, events, and movements. It wasn't simply about replacing one um, kind of white man on a horse with another white man on a horse or a contemporary white man on a horse. It was more broadly about how we uh, find those voices and lift them uh, through the lens of, again, people, places, events, and movements. And so we organized with individuals through public proposals. We reflected those pu public proposals back into the world. We worked with artists and authors to tell stories that were uh, historically uh, buried in this process. Um, and so in total, we were able to produce uh, around 50 different pieces of art that makes contemporary artwork with, um, with stories and narratives from, from, from uh, academics and, and community uh, authors uh, and historians uh, around the city, uh, sharing out these uh, bright, colorful, beautiful pieces of work mostly from almost enti entirely from uh, New Orleans artists and writers uh, and put them in public. These became a part of the lexicon for a few years in which people referenced both in school and in public. Um, we ran a public process in which we did uh, what we called framing histories and uh, allowed these to exist across as stumble upons across the entire city and so as people walked around the city they would see uh, these pieces in relationship to sites that were proximate to uh, where some of these events where some of these people where some of these movements um, lived or or framed themselves one of the ways and one of the reasons we did this was in large part because uh, our stories, our narratives, these 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 things that we hold to be so uh, a part of the DNA of our of our cultural uh, story, is that over time, whether people, uh, um, environmental, political considerations affect the way stories are told. And so you see uh, in the Sassy Servants, the belligerent Bridget's uh, poster, you see this idea that you know one might post something or one might hold a story to be true, but over time, uh, those stories get shrouded, the words get obfuscated. Um, and we have to reconcile that as, as, as communities. These stories are not static, they are dynamic by their very nature. Um, even though we believe that truth exists um, in, in a moment, it truly is, is um, something that exists along a timeline and we have to, to be able to, to reference that. And so I want to tell you just a couple stories real quick before I get into the, the meat of what, what we did. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes, but a couple reasons why this is so important from the cultural organizing side of things. You know, there was a poster, The Desire Standoff, which is an extremely important moment in New Orleans history where we saw the Black Panther Party uh, face off or be assaulted uh, by the state police, um, state and local police. Over 200 police officers and a tank showed up to a cultural center for uh, the Black Panther Party in the Ninth Ward. And shot hundreds and hundreds of bullets uh, through this space. Now, uh, because uh, they were able to understand that there were young people there that day, they were feeding people from the, the, the uh, free breakfast program. Um, one of the things that happens is that when we tell these stories and we tell them publicly, uh, a gentleman who was there, who was one of the young people being served breakfast, uh, who worked for the city in his 50s now, um, he was able to stand here. He saw this poster, he connected with it and, and essentially stood out and was a public docent uh, to this project for months on end. And he served as a, a contemporary reference to a particular moment in time for the city that is again, lost to history if we're not able to publicly declare uh, both the, the triumphs and, and, and traumas uh, of, of place. Um, second is Dorothy May Taylor, who helped to desegregate New Orleans um, Mardi Gras. And we saw that um, in 1992, right? Um, this poster was found by her family. Her family saw this uh, posted. They took a picture, they made t-shirts, and they still go to City Hall to this day 
um, to continue her legacy. Uh, so I think these are important things. So they're not just stories that are buried, they're still active uh, um, constituent stories that, that are a part of our, our, the fabric of our city. And so we think about how that works to challenge, uh, to, to establish a project framework that served to collect posters and proposals that restores the complexity of narratives in our environment that leverages the existing systems uh, that, we, uh, that we communicate um, with throughout our, our existence in this, in this city um, that uses transit systems as a means to um, connect with folks who are generally um, disconnected or, or disinherited from the process of, of city building or city making or city shaping. Um, to connect to civic infrastructure like libraries, we made sure that the posters the poster distribution pathway was through the, the public library. Uh, we created newspapers that made this uh, information accessible at all times, giving over 20,000 newspapers out to the public. We use cultural institutions to kind of spread the word. We talked to schools and universities um, and we occupied public space in the name of justice, in the name of, of reverence to these narratives, both the historic uh, narratives, but the narratives of contemporary, uh, of, of, of the people who exist in this city now, um, those who can tell stories about the past, but also can tell the stories of, of their own um, engagement with, with this city. And so in doing so, um, both in the, in the public forums and in pr public proposals, uh, we asked about culture and how that was, was referential and how that might be seen and referenced in our work, uh, how families influence us, how legacy, the legacy of individuals in the city can be uh, demonstrably uh, shown, how women who anchor the, the history and stories of this city and so much of this nation um, are revered. Um, and then we started to imagine what that might look like in, in total, uh, whether that's the, the lighthearted, uh, where there's a gramophone on top of a former pedestal for a monument, uh, or the more somber uh, reflections on uh, the history of enslavement in the city of New Orleans. And so I'll just leave you with the fact that um, speculating on a, a just future or speculating on monumentality through the perspective of community voice um, and primary community voice, not a distillation or not a, a uh, uh, disconnected version of what those stories are is extremely important. And the ways that we move forward through monumentality are going to continue uh, to, to, to be more refined as we start to hear those stories and hear those voices uh, over time. So. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to more of this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to Shoshana right now. Thank you. Um, good evening or good afternoon. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about a couple of things that my um, my place of work is engaged in right now. Um, I have titled my talk today Exhibitions in the Service of Public Spaces and my goal is to present two examples of instances when something in a public space, whether it's a customary sculptural group or, or a statue or perhaps more ephemeral type mem memorial has been moved indoors in the form of an exhibition for the purpose of helping us comprehend its role in the city's life. My two examples are, um, they differ in that one of them is, is an exhibition after the fact, as it looks at the circumstances which surrounded the removal of numerous politically charged statues um, following the fall of communism just a couple of years after 1990. The other exhibition will be, so to speak, before the fact in that it is part of a preparatory stage for a memorial dedicated to victims of sexual assault, which will be established somewhere in Budapest in 2023. 
In fact, this exhibition will showcase the entries that will come in for an open call. And hopefully during the exhibition, we can have roundtable discussions that will be open to the public. And thus in this instance, the exhibition venue will become a forum for civil societies and the general public to familiarize themselves with an ongoing project. These differences aside, there are important similarities and connections between the two exhibitions. Most obviously in that both case studies are tied to the municipality of Budapest. And I emphasize this because Budapest is made up of 20 plus districts. Each of these districts have their own self-government and they have their own policies for installing new statues. And in fact, as a result in the past 10, 15 years, we've seen an exponential amount of statues placed out on streets and squares of Budapest. Add to this statues that are uh, commissioned by the national government, but placed in Budapest squares. But the examples I will speak of today are monuments and memorials commissioned by the municipality of Budapest and they are thus the property of Budapest. And I emphasize this because I think it's sometimes overlooked that these monuments are items in an inventory, um, not just as value, but as works of art with an intangible value, or at least according to their museum-like inventory cards. Allow me to say just a few words about the Budapest Gallery. It consists of two departments, the Department of Art and Public Spaces, while it oversees the process of putting up new statues and monuments in Budapest. The majority of its work is to um, basically maintain existing statues, numerous statues. Um, some of these go back to the Baroque era, but the majority of them are from the 20th century. The other larger half of the gallery is the exhibition department. And as its name suggests, it's primarily concerned with um, organizing exhibitions in various venues, and it also oversees uh, an extensive international residency program. And the two projects that I'm gonna talk about today um, are collaborations between these two departments. And they are also an illustration of how there's a heightened interest um, in the role of monuments in Budapest on the part of the current leadership, which was elected in 2019, and it's a coalition of opposition parties in Hungary. The current Budapest leadership changed course radically in its approach to monuments, and it is currently in the process of transforming its policies um, to, to reflect this new approach of how monuments and statues should be erected in the city. In 1990, very soon after the fall of communism, the municipality of Budapest asked the individual districts to provide a list of monuments that were erected between 1945 and 1989 that they wished to remove from their then current locations. Interestingly, there was not an overwhelming response. Many districts decided to do the job themselves and some didn't even take the effort to reply. Um, some statues uh, were not removed, but they were altered. So inscriptions that had some sort of reference to communism were taken off the statue. Today, there are 16 works in Budapest that preserve the orientation of the memory politics of the communist era. The decision to keep some of these works was motivated in part by the desire to preserve historical documentation and also the desire to preserve social stability. As part of the preparatory work for this exhibition, several interviews were conducted with former colleagues of the Budapest Gallery, um, who were art historians and engineers who oversaw the process of removing these statues from public spaces. They were asked about their memories as to how the public reacted to, to the removal of these statues. And they said that sometimes these removals were hailed by the public and other times they were protest. In the case of the statue of Marx and Engels, um, there was a sign by a protester that was photographed and it reads in Hungarian, it reads, toppling sculptures, book burning. One of the most interesting remarks one of the interviewees made was that even in this emotionally heightened 
environment or circumstance when arguably the majority of the population was keen on seeing these images of oppression go, the people charged with the task of removing these statues were still intent on treating them as works of art. Part of the reason was that in many instances, the sculptors who had sometimes reluctantly created these monuments were still alive. But the main reason was that um, from the very beginning, there was a plan to place these statues in a designated statue park. This statue park is called the Memento Sculpture Park. And it is found in a semi-rural district um, on the outskirts of, of Budapest, um, still within the city borders. Um, and it is very popular with young tourists from the West. And although it is, it is far from having a communist theme park-like quality like the Grutus Park in Lithuania, there is, for example, a replica of Stalin's boots, which was all that remained after the eight meter tall statue was toppled during the 1956 revolution. Uh, this replica is not an accurate copy of the original and thus in certain respects, it undermines the approach represented by the Budapest Gallery colleague or former colleague by treating these as works of art. Just to quickly touch on another aspect of monuments in public spaces, which is sometimes overlooked, the location of a given monument is sometimes as laden with meaning as the figure or the idea the monument represents. At the entrance of Memento Park is a statue of Marx and Engels. Originally, it stood um, in front of the so-called White House. So in the middle of the picture, you see the statue. On the right is the White House. It was the headquarters of the Communist Party. Um, so in the early 1990s, the statue was removed. And two years ago, another statue was placed in its location. This statue is of the communist leader Imre Nagy, who turned against the party in 1956 and became the leader of the uprising and was consequently executed by the communist. His statue was originally in a location near the parliament, which is what you see in the background of the statue. Um, but two years ago, when the current national government decided to renovate the state, the, the square in front of the parliament and return it to its pre-1945 uh, condition or state, um, this was removed. It was placed where the Marx and Engels statue had originally been and a memorial to the victims of the Red Terror was placed in this location in front of the parliament. Finally, let me say a few words about the other project I mentioned. In 2020, the city announced that by 2023, it would create a memorial site dedicated to victims of rape against women during wartime. This has been termed as a kind of sample project for the city's new approach to erecting monuments to which I alluded to earlier. The final step in this long-term endeavor in which together with the Budapest History Museum and the Budapest City Archives and numerous scholars from the fields of gender studies, history, art history, and sociology are participating will be perhaps an entirely ephemeral memorial. But the series of lectures, the scholarly research, the interviews, the roundtable discussions, the collections of oral history and ego documents, the creation of a large focus database and the two exhibitions that will be held leading up to it will hopefully have a lasting educational impact. The goal is to provide a wide spectrum of sources to further a nuanced understanding of this sensitive and often overlooked aspect of war. Um, I come from a different background than my fellow panelists. Hungary never had colonies, and one could argue that there is a prevailing narrative among Hungarians that they have been an oppressed people, ruled and dominated by various other nations over the centuries. The removal of communist statues today, today seems like an almost self-evident step in the liberation of the human geography of the city from decades of occupation. And the memorial dedicated to rape victims of wartime also represents a historical fact of war 
the dreadfulness of which one presumes cannot be questioned. But if there are any questions left as to the manner of the removal of monuments or the creation of a memorial, they must be addressed. And the two upcoming exhibitions will provide an opportunity for such debates to take place on these historical events, which had an overwhelming impact on Hungarian society. So thank you. And I too look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. And we'll pass it over to Rebecca. Hi. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, just new to this um, uh, material, this way of speaking. Um, so, uh, Melissa, could you please play the first video and play it twice? Thank you. So on, on August 29th uh, of last year, uh, Melissa, can we hold please? On August 29th of last year um, in Montreal, um, the statue of John A. Macdonald, who was Canada's first prime minister was toppled uh, during a demonstration by uh, people who were um, attending this, um, this event with the idea of uh, defunding police and uh, police reform in the country. So to tell you a bit about uh, John A. Macdonald, um, you know, Canada's first prime minister and his relationship to indigenous people was that he was the, uh, I guess the, um, the architect of uh, what is known in Canada as the Indian residential school system, which was a nationwide program where children would be taken, uh, removed from family and put into these, uh, these schools. And the idea really was uh, to uh, uh, assimilate us Indians. And this, I'd like to read a quote from um, Johnny McDonald when he's speaking about uh, his idea uh, of this, this school system. So his quote is, when the school is on the reserve, the child is with his parents who are savages. He is surrounded by savages. He is simply a savage who can read and write. So what he was talking about is, you know, this whole idea of educating us and assimilating us uh, through uh, the removal of children. Uh, in the end, he, it was still kind of like a racist call where he was saying we would simply be a savage who can read and write. So that's, you know, the first prime minister of Canada who is, you know, uh, thought to be like a nation builder and the father, the father of confeder confederation. Um, um, I guess, you know, in terms of myself as a visual artist, um, I was very uh, taken with uh, the imagery, like the video of the toppling of the statue of uh, McDonald in Montreal uh, just last year and to see his head, you know, uh, <clears throat> being severed and bouncing on the sidewalk. So I guess in terms of like thinking about this monument um, in particular and what um, he represents for us indigenous people here in Canada. Um, maybe we could play the next, uh, oh, the, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, I find this strange, the Zoom stuff, but bear with me. So what I want to show you now is this image, which is the Manit Manitoba Legislative Building in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. And I lived there in, um, for a couple of years in the early 2000s. So I'm very familiar with this, with this uh, piece of architecture. And um, in the foreground, you can see that there is a, there's a monument, which is Queen Victoria. And so Queen Victoria uh, was the uh, reigning queen at the time of, you know, the, uh, the introduction of the uh, residential, residential school system. So for me, 
you know, these, both these monuments, uh, McDonald and uh, Queen Victoria, uh, you know, say a lot about uh, what happened here in Canada uh, to us Indigenous people. So uh, this building was uh, completed in 1920. And I'd like to play the next video. Melissa, please. Of the security guards. I'll get back to you. So, um, okay, we can um, stop there with that. So, uh, this young woman is, her name is uh, Brenda Ducharme, and she posted this uh, video that she took of herself. Uh, she posted it on January 12th of 2013. And she was at um, on January 11th, there was uh, to be, there was a, a rally uh, that took place uh, at the legislative building uh, there in Winnipeg. And it was organized by uh, a group of um, like uh, grassroots uh, group of people, indigenous people and, and non-indigenous non as well, where uh, the organization, if you want to call it that, uh, it was was called Idle No More. So you know, in in 2012 and 2013 here in Canada and and other parts of the world, there was this uh, movement, which was originate which originated with the three Indigenous women and one non-Indigenous woman. So they they created this movement where, using social media, there they would uh, organize events, rallies, protests, and uh, often um, how these, these events would uh, manifest themselves, would, there would be what is uh, known as a round dance. So if you're familiar with, uh, I guess, the powwow uh, within, you know, within our indigenous culture, the round dance is a dance that is, um, it's about welcoming, it's about uh, community, it's about uh, being together. And so I don't know more would organize these rallies and people would, you know, they would speak, but they would also dance. So I was really taken with this, this, um, this movement because it was, you know, a lot of young people and a lot of young people are of course, you know, very adept at using social media. So they would be like flash, you know, round dances. And I was living in Winnipeg, you know, in 2012 and 2013. And there was, a, it was pretty amazing. I saw it on the news. There was a round dance at one of the major intersections in the city. And uh, there was like an aerial view. So when you're looking down at the intersection, you could see like hundreds of people holding hands and dancing in a circle. It was quite beautiful uh, visually. Um, so Brenda Ducharme uh, on uh, January 11th went into the Manitoba Legislative Building. Um, so in Manitoba in the winter, it's, the temperatures can be extreme. And so she went in because she, was, she arrived early to this rally that was to take place on the same day. 
she arrived early and she went into the legislative building. Um, and she was wearing her uh, jingle dress regalia and um, proceeded to dance inside the building, you know? And so for me, it's, it's really strikes me as, you know, this young woman having the courage um, and, you know, the will to go into uh, what is essentially a monument, a monument to colonialism. And I'm quite, you know, I'm so, what, I watch this over and over, you know, now and then, because I think it really speaks to this idea of um, the body uh, and the body as a, a, a mode or a vehicle for protest. And so um, in the video, I think, I believe she's saying, I'm at the legislature, I'm early, meaning she's early for the rally, um, but I'm not allowed to wait, but I am dancing. And then she says, I'm waiting for the supervisor of the security guards. So, and then she says, she'll get back to us. So I, I really um, uh, just think of this, this, this action, this, her protest as being very powerful and the idea of the indigenous female body going inside the monument. Uh, next slide, please, Melissa. Slide, yeah. Oh. So this is a, a photo of the inside of the legislative building and so it's, you know, it's not the greatest picture, but um, if you look um, down this grand staircase, you know, at the foot of the staircase are two uh, life-size uh, uh, bronze sculptures of a bison. And so the next slide, please. This, uh, this photo, which is, you know, it's a famous image. I'm sure many have seen this picture before. So this mountain of bison skulls, um, this photo was taken in 1882 outside the Michigan Carbon Works building in Rougeville, Michigan. So in thinking about, you know, this young woman, Brenda Ducharme, going into the legislative building, this monument to colonialism and dancing, um, for me is, uh, you know, inside that building, there are these sculptures of the bison. And then if you look at this monument to the, to the extermination of the bison and how that affected indigenous people who lived, you know, in those territories. So, um, yeah, that's, I think this, you know, this kind of, uh, this young woman going in to the monument and then to see this monumental mountain of, of destruction, you know, of, you know, of the bison themselves, but also uh, the life of the people. So next slide, please. In, um, this is uh, my work, which is titled uh, in Oji Cree. Um, it's uh, Ayumi Awach, Omama, Omama Mawan. And it, uh, that translates into speaking to their mother. So in, in 1990, here in Canada, there was what is now referred to as the Oka crisis, or you can think of it as the Kanasatake resistance, where the Mohawk nation uh, of Kanasatake uh, took up arms to defend their land. And the adjacent town, which is the town of Oka, wanted to extend their golf course eight more holes and onto uh, Mohawk land. So of course there was a, a conflict which, which ended up being uh, like a, a, an occupation of 70 days where the Mohawk nation was surrounded by the police at first and then the Canadian military eventually came in. And so, um, it lasted for 78 days and I, I was a young artist at that time. So, and thinking about, you know, all that was going on across this country, 
um, the racism that you know reared its uh, ugly you know head that's always there you know like waiting and so for me it was a very intense uh, moment for me as an indigenous person uh, and also an artist. So in 1991, I had the opportunity to go to the Banff Center in Alberta, the Banff Center for the Arts and for a residency. And during this residency, this object was created. So I was thinking about, I was thinking about protest because during the Oka crisis, uh, protests took place all across the country in support of the Mohawk nation. And so um, in, uh, 1991, I created this object in 1992, which was 500 years, I guess that, that year marked 500 years since Columbus. Um, so it was really interesting in, in 1992 to take this object across the country to First Nations communities, to indigenous communities that were um, on reserve, uh, rural or in the cities. Next slide, please. And Rebecca, I hate to interrupt you, but um, we do want to make sure we have time for Q&A if we could give it one more moment or so. Thank you. Okay. So, um, sorry, um, this is it. So I took it to various places across the country and I basically asked people to come forward and speak to our mother, the land itself. Because, you know, this work came out of a land dispute and I think that I was interested in thinking about, um, you know, kind of like bypassing government and Canadians and speaking directly to the land that has known us for uh, much longer than this country has. Okay, thank you, sorry. I'm done. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if everyone can see me, so hopefully you can. Um, I just wanted to go over some key phrases um, and invite all of our panelists back to the conversation. Um, so you can put your video and, and well, keep, put your video on and keep yourself muted, I guess, until you have to answer. So there are just some key phrases that I that just wanted to um, highlight that I heard from, from you all and I think would be an interesting framing for our conversation. Um, I just love the way in which there's so many different um, points of connection that we can discuss today. And so I will try to be brief uh, as I'm doing it. So the first, um, you know, from Mayor Reese, different truths, drivers of change, symbols versus substance. Um, from Bryant, I love this idea of fiction preceding form, an idea of just futures, uh, speculative futures and public proposals. Um, Shoshana um, spoke about memory politics, which I think is really a kind of term that connects all of us as well. Social stability, um, as well as um, just thinking about uh, competing histories um, and, and also what's considered an art, uh, a work of art versus um, something that serves as propaganda, so to speak, right? And then with Rebecca, um, I was really struck by a term that is very clear in, in connection between you and Mayor Reese as well as the, the idea of toppling, what that means, uh, politics of disruption, as well as um, the, the body as a vehicle for protest and this idea of going inside of a monument and thus becoming a monument one's, on, on one's own terms. So those are just some ideas that I just wanna have the audience and for us to kind of think about. One of the biggest, um, things that I thought was really interesting because um, Mayor Reese, you, you were talking about um, your own relationship um, to the monument, but then also um, the ways in which as a, a, a public figure an elected official, um, it wasn't necessarily your responsibility to, to take it down, right? But that, but that you understood uh, and maybe in, in, in agreed with um, the need uh, for its removal on some level. And I guess I just wanted to open that up to everyone, like whose property are these monuments? Because it does seem as if there's a way in which um, these, you know, I think when Rebecca was talking about the taking down the McDonald monument, and if you look at how public officials responded to that, many of the public officials considered it a mob or considered it an attack and a, a, as if um, 
the, these monuments are supposed to represent only one part of the citizenry and not necessarily to be inclusive of everyone. So I guess my question is both my, of them, yeah. Uh, uh, there's a legal question whose property, but then I'm speaking of in terms of memory, whose property do we think of these monuments as belonging to? Go ahead. I just, can I just say, it, no, I do think it's the responsibility of public officials to take it down. Oh, okay. All I'm saying is we're not on an even level, a level playing field. Mm. So when I was interviewed um, on our local news channel, um, for example, they asked this question, BBC, notoriously race and class privileged organisation, to be perfectly frank. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, now you're coming and asking me why I didn't take it down. First of all, why didn't you mm -hmm. ask any political leaders why they didn't take it down 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right, before a black person was elected? And then mm -hmm. secondly, you wait 400 years for a black political leader of the city and then suddenly the statute of slavery is my fault. Mm -hmm. I said, how does that work? Mm -hmm. So for me, it wasn't about whether I take it it, it, was a, it was about the strategy of how you go about doing this stuff. Interestingly, which has not hit the news, next to the statue is a, a concert venue called the Colston Hall, it, right? That was what a lot of people were actually focused on in the city, changing the name of the Colston Hall. The statue was secondary. Now, funny enough, we have changed the name of the Colston Hall, but it's not in the news. Why? Because we, we were looking at funding the renovation of the Colston Hall. We talked to the board. Change the name and they were going to announce it in March last year, but then the lockdown through COVID meant that they delayed the, the announcement. But that name has now changed, it's called Bristol Beacon, no longer called. But the, herein is something about the public appetite and the journalistic appetite for this debate, which is poor, is that's not news because it wasn't all down with people. It was a normally process in which we had a discussion about whether that name was appropriate for the main concert venue in the middle of the city um, anymore. But my sensitivity was was around how much how much media focus this has brought on me. If I had taken that statue down as my act, I would have spent the next four years talking about the statue, right? And I wouldn't have had any political capital left to build affordable homes, tackle education inequalities, to deal with uh, you know to deal with criminal justice. So. It's just about where I where I expend my political capital at what point. That that's that's the the judgment that, you know I was making. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond or, or add? Sorry, I can add just a quick uh, like a brief uh, note here. Uh, I had nowhere near the, the the kind of power structure or framing that the mayor has, but uh, I worked for the city uh, for a few years in a quasi governmental agency as the the civic design director. Um, and so a couple things about who owns statues, I think, is, is an extremely important question. Uh, one is that, you know, for me as a black man in a city of New Orleans, 60% African American, um, I, Robert E. Lee was the highest statue in our city for, uh, for 120 some odd years. Now, um, I, I've had people ask me whether or not uh, descendants of Robert E. Lee, or I was a descendant of Robert E. Lee, as my last name is Lee. Um, so, so there's like this, this A, there's like a uh, uh, when we talk about like ownership, there's like a, a sordid connection between ownership of humans as well uh, and ownership of land that I think wants to be kind of brought up in terms of the lionization and elevation of specifically of slaveholders um, in, in the United States. Now, from a uh, from a political uh, kind of standpoint, uh, we dealt with two things. First, uh, there's art is completely undervalued in the states, and so. Funding for the arts, specifically maintenance for the arts, is is uh, pretty much off the table in, in most spaces. Now there are there are about 100 150 cities that invest it in a really strong way, and that's that's solid. But ultimately, uh, what we faced was that the city did not know where uh, who, who within the city owned the property. So anything that was that was established after 1982 or 1983 uh, was a part of the uh, was a part of the Arts Council's catalog. Anything that was established before that was a part of uh, property management. Property management don't didn't know anything about that. And so there's these these conflicts even within this the city around who maintains and and supports those. And so I think the strategy is right uh, for Mayor Reese in that you know for us we invested. Uh, thousands of dollars to the potential of new monuments once this, the city, quote unquote, decided which uh, monuments were going to be torn down. So our job was to say, 
it is the right thing and thusly however it happens we will apply dollars to make that happen so that's just a, a quick little anecdote from our side of things okay did it uh, well i can ask another question i think everyone will be able to um respond to as well this idea um there's almost like there's it was interesting to have um mayor reese and then brian go after you know back to back because um there was a, a tension i think and i was curious not between you two but these ideas of um what brian talks about as form following fiction and what mayor reese described as um you know substance and symbols right and so that i think when you talk to the people who may have taken down the statue and you were asking them well, what was the substantive the, what were the policy um changes that they sought and for some of those people i imagine it was simply taking down the statue itself meant um it was it created a possibility for certain sorts of policies to come into place and so i guess i wanted to talk to everyone about and then also shoshana as you talked about you know the what's considered a work of art versus something that's seen as a, an oppressive symbol from the past. And so this, this connection between art as both a driver of change and then um, art being the thing that um, may be in lieu of policy, right? Like this tension that we have. I was curious, how do you all um, as people who are, and then also um, Rebecca, I thought it was really powerful to have, um, you know, um, the, the young woman that you showed us that was occupying the site of municipal power um, as both an alternative to um, various ways in w to the McDonald's statue on some level, um, but also um, just another way of thinking about democracy and citizenship and belonging and occupation. So my big question, I guess, is, is there a tension between art as a driver of change and art being the change itself? And so I wonder how you all think about this, because it's something that really I spend much of my time trying to think through this question as well as a as an administrator and as an artist and activist. Is that too okay? Does anyone want to jump in? Okay. <laughs> well, do you want to unpack this relationship between fiction preceding form or art preceding policy? Well, can I just say, I, I think in this area, there's no absolute truth. So what immediately came to mind was like, um, and I'm treading on thin ice here, right? But I, I lived in Washington for a year. I lived in Philadelphia and then New Haven. I married an American. So I'm over there quite a bit, but I'm not claiming to be. Okay. But I, I drew parallels with integration, right? Integration is, is a real issue of substance, right? But the danger is, when I was living in Washington, I read an article called Integration was the worst thing that happened to African Americans <laughs> because it integrated people into inequality, right? Mm. And, and so in some sense, a, an issue of real substance can easily become a symbol that doesn't actually lead to the liberation that people were, were, were working for. And I, so I, I, it, it, it's, not, it's not that there's an absolute truth on either side. It's, it's that the events happen and symbols are massively important because this, what did Ben Oakley say? If you want to destroy people, destroy the stories they tell about themselves, right? So these things are massively significant, but it's just that over time, they need to, they, they all, that their meaning is the product of, the, of their interaction with what's around them uh, as well. Hmm. If I was being flippant, I would say, um, if you give me a choice of walking to work as a black man down Colston Street to a well-paid job that allows me to give my children a deposit for a house and guarantees their movement into higher education and allows me to put some money in my community and walking down Smith Street to unemployment, I'll walk down Colston Street. Now that doesn't mean that I want Colston Street to, to, um, uh, to be there, but I've just used that to kind of illustrate the point that we, the, 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 the acts and the symbols and the stories have to be attached to have to be attached to substantive uh, change. And in fact, the, the pulling down of the statue is in many ways, what Brian's talking about for me, is a story. If we choose to live it, it's been hauled down. It's been rolled through the streets, just like a lynching in many ways, right? It's been thrown in the docks and, and brutalized. Now that is a new story that Bristol has a chance to live out. But unless that substantive change comes, then that act 
in some sense becomes meaningless and can become a source of cynicism because people will say, well, we did the act that should have ushered in a new era. The new era hasn't come. Is anything ever going to change? And you end up in a in a very uh, you know bad place. Rebecca Shoshana, any thoughts? On uh, oh, Rebecca, we can't hear you, so. Oh boy, thanks. Um, I was just, uh, you know, in my imagination, um, uh, you know, the beauty of the bouncing head of, uh, of McDonald, you know, was, um, was really something to, to witness, you know, through um, the media. And then also, um, knowing that there are there are eleven uh, statues of him in this country, and uh, a number of years ago, I can't remember exactly when, but not recently, um, the statue of him in the city of Victoria here in BC was removed. So one is, you know, in storage, and the one in Montreal is going to be repaired. So it'll probably go back up. So I think you know, you know, for us here in this country and for us indigenous people, you know, um, I think, you know, like uh, action, like, like I don't know more, uh, doing a round dance, occupy, taking over space, um, even um, for a moment. And I think in my practice as a performance artist, that's exactly what I, did, what I do. So, you know, to go out into the public realm and to take up a moment and to, uh, to address something and to bear witness. So I think these are like, uh, maybe it's like an anti-monument kind of I thing that's going on. Um, so we'll see. I have no idea what's gonna happen with McDonald's in the future. Uh, I think the Hungarian examples that I spoke about, they, um, they are very complex in the sense that some of these statues were, were done by artists who didn't necessarily agree with the then current communist or socialist regime, but they were forced, um, maybe only financially, but they were forced into creating these monuments. And there are some monuments which um, the artists later on after the fall of communism have, have talked about how they, you know, they try to sneak in criticism about the regime. Um, but, but nevertheless, you know, when an artist creates something, it's, 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 it's a work of art. And a work of art definitely has the power to change. Um, the question is when something is out in the public, in a public space, it also, it's not just a work of art, it also is a, a, do, a dominant, it reflects, it's a symbol, you know, a very dominant symbol of something. So that's where the, I think the danger lies. And I think an okay solution for that is by putting them somewhere in a designated spot where they can serve education, they can serve documentation of a previous era or a previous um, system of um, values um, for, for later generations. Um, I have a, a question from the, the, the audience about um, a kind of question about democracy and collaboration. Um, when one's reassessing what kinds of monuments should be created, not necessarily the ones that um, may be taken down. So. The question, I guess, is how does one go about creating? And I think, you know, Brian's um, the public proposals maybe one answer to this. But how does one go about creating um, truly like democratic um, monuments? And then I would ask that, you know, one of the things. So um, we took uh, the mayor of North New Jersey, Raz Baraka. He approved of taking down of the Columbus statue here, and I was there that night, and I had no idea how. Um, liberating watching that would be right like you just don't know and I, I think if I, no one has experienced the taking down of a statue that's lorded over them for so long that's been a, a symbol of oppression you actually you, you, you can't experience or don't understand why this is such a phenomenon truly but the question is um so one are there ways of creating democratic collaborative 
um, imaginations or, or ways of making new monuments? And then also, are there ways of creating new points of identification? So the the mayor, when you talked about the, the group of people who were um, creating what was perceived as a counter protest and, and they were worried about losing their city. Um, and for me, it's always been interesting that Italian Americans, over some Italian Americans overly identify with Columbus. Like he, there are so many other maybe better figures uh, to identify with. And yet there's this myth that one to be Italian American, one has to overly identify with Columbus. And I, I wonder if there are, are ways of creating new points of identification for people um, who, who feel like they're losing their history or losing their culture with these new monuments as well. So anyone can answer that. Or, or maybe so, that's so, just not what we should be thinking about. Go on, Brian. Uh, I was just gonna say that, so two notes. One is that like, you know, I, I think the, the biggest problem with the, the kind of false narratives of, of distant, distant past um, allow for those who are hungry for narratives. We are, we are, as a people, we are hungry for stories because they tell us, they guide us in small ways uh, on our next step. And if we create a vacuum of narratives that can shape out a more rounded worldview, um, it, is, it is evident and it's very clear that people will attach to, to uh, violent myths of, or so they will attach the, merit of the, the narratives that allow them to move forward regardless of whether or not they are violent. Right? I think that's the that's the key there. And so there should be, I believe there should be ongoing processes by which we're allowed to uh, express um, the, again, the, the, the kind of total storylines of, of people, places, events, and movements that shape our, the entirety of our society. And I think that's extremely important in this work. Um, and then I think the, the uh, you were mentioning something earlier, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think, I think this work requires us to not just isolate and do this again as a, as a singular moment, but to, um, but to expand our ability as, as cities to collect uh, our stories in perpetuity. Like it should be a part of our ongoing uh, collective dialogue. Can I, can I just add that? So I, one of the points I've been making repeatedly is um, we shouldn't be afraid of contradiction and hypocrisy uh, within our narratives. I said, I'm a fallen human being just like everyone else. I'm full of my own internal contradictions and hypocrisies. In my city of half a million people, if you put half a million people in a spot of land and give them 2000 years of history, you don't think there's gonna be any hypocrisy, contradiction? That's, that's what it means to be human. One of the problems is that people have wanted to have no criticism of their heroes. They've wanted to not know about any of their, their flaws. And, and, and again, one of the things about having historians leading on our history commission is that we're saying this is perfectly normal. This is, is this is not about trying to make anyone feel guilty. This is about doing good quality history and not being naive and, uh, and childish. Now, actually in the process of that, if we open up the doors to people actually beginning to deal with the complexity of some individuals, there may come a time when they say, do you know what? This complexity has crossed the line now. <laughs> this person is no longer the kind of person we want to associate with. One of the appeals I've made in the city is, if you want to have the statue of Colston up, right? I can't change your heart to have that desire, but at least, at least do it honestly. Let's be honest about saying you're prepared to overlook the fact that he's a slave trader, 80,000 African men, uh, women and children made his money and you're prepared to overlook that. You know, I, I'm not going to rag on you about it, but let's just be honest about that, that history. And that, that's one of the problems. It's alternative facts. It's a dishonesty. It's a fear of contradiction and hypocrisy that has stunted our ability to go on that journey uh, that we said is that constant journey that we just um, heard, I think we need to, to be on. Does anyone want to add before I um, wrap up? Rebecca, you, and Shasha, you look deep in thought, so. <laughs> yeah. um, I think, um, you know, like in thinking about, uh, you know, creating new mon monuments, um, getting rid of old monuments. Um, I just somehow, uh, maybe it's, uh, it'll be like an ongoing process that has to um, shed and move forward and then shed again and move forward. So it's like, where are we gonna end up and how many monuments, how many monuments do we need? Um, so I guess in, 
and like I just like to say that I I really admire um, like uh, movements like Occupy, Idle No More because I think it's the idea of of um, I guess being in the moment and um, being together and articulating ideas and speaking and occupying space and time and marking uh, history through the body. So maybe um, I'm not sure about monuments hmm. and their, you know, their function, their long-term function. I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think um, at the point where a monument becomes a physical, something big, it, it has a danger of, um, well, then being undermined. So I think um, ephemeral types, um, process type monuments, or even, you know, the, the, the poster um, type monuments that Brian was showing, um, that, that has a much more it has more potential to to spread the word and and um, change how change people's perception of the past. Can Thank I just you. add one last oh, thing? Sorry, sure, go. Yeah, one last go thing okay. in relationship <laughs> to the Columbus conversation. I remember what I was trying to say. I used to so when people would ask me this question during presentations, I would always ask uh, kind of those with privilege and power in the room. Uh, and specifically white people in, in the States, like, do you not know any good white people? Like, like, like just, just as you sit with this conversation, you know, are there not people that you can point to that don't have slavery in their background, that don't have abuse and violence and torture in their background? It's a very simple question, but it, I mean, the, 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 the kind of crux of it is that there are there's a lot of white people out there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of <laughs> people in general. And so you are actively not, you are actively ignoring the fact that there are people who have done good for the service of all humanity and you're ignoring it. And that's a question that, that we all have to deal with in ourselves. Can we uh, move towards uh, other individuals, communities, cultures that are serving for the betterment of humanity? Thank you. This was so, um so rich and robust. Um, so thank you all for, uh, to our audience for participating, uh, to Next City and Highline, um, and to our illustrious panelists. And I'm gonna uh, introduce or bring on uh, Mauricio, uh, who will close us out today. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mauricio Garcia. I'm the Chief Program and Engagement Officer with the Highline. First of all, thanks to everyone who joined the event today. And for those of you who joined yesterday or both, um, your interest in and engagement with the subject will be critical as to a lot of what the, the panelists and moderators have been talking about, the future of shaping what, the, uh, what monuments can and, and should and maybe look like in the future. So thank you for, for your participation. And a big shout out and thank you to Salamisha, to the panelists today and to yesterday for, for your time. I know this, is, this does take time, these conversations do take some thought and, and preparation. Um, so thank you again for your time and insights. Um, thanks to our many supporters, uh, to the Next City and, and the Highline who helped make events like this possible. Um, and again, just internally a big shout out and tip of the hat to the Next City and Highline teams who collaborated on this two day event. Uh, collaboration and engagement is a beautiful thing. Uh, so more of these events are, are hopefully coming, uh, coming your way. Um, you'll be able to find the recordings. I know there's a big question. You'll be able to find the recordings of this two day event on the Next City archive. Uh, the highlight will also be, be sharing that. Um, and there's a link in the chat to those to, that, to the Next City Archive. Uh, Next City will also be creating an ebook with multiple monument related stories and excerpts from this two day event. You can also find a link in the ebook uh, archive uh, in this chat as well. And then lastly, we have linked to an overview of the Highline's New Monuments for New Cities initiative, which was the, one of the major inspirations for this event uh, over the next last two days. Uh, the chat will remain live for a few minutes um, as we end our event, so please take a moment to capture some, some notes, uh, some folks you want to network with, um, but thank you again uh, for, taking, uh, for taking time to, to join us today and yesterday. Thanks to our uh, panelists and moderator, and see you next time. Thank you.
of the world.